Om Sahana Vavitu Sahana Bonatu Sahaviryam Karvavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 I'm below Sakur Shivananda Mirjaki. Jai. For all the saints and sages of all the traditions. Jai. Jai. Um, um, <laughs> so, the book goes on. It's, very, it's an amazing study. Um, the words are somewhat different that are used. And classification's a little different. Swamiji talked about that yesterday. Um, and even the reading that we took from Swami Shivananda last night, different people will say this or that. Um, it's okay. So we're looking for something to stand on, but there's only one thing to stand on. And um, in the meanwhile, ego is, is caught up in the identification game and wanting to wanting to stand on a very precise identity, which it can feel and touch and like this. Um, so we get this, which word is it? Is it this word or that word? Is it this teaching or that teaching? Which one of the two is better? Which one's correct? Which one's wrong? In the, um, in the different traditions of the world, we get that same with the ego sense, right? Is it Christianity or is it Islam or is it Buddhism or is it, and then which sect is it? <laughs> and which teacher specifically is it? <laughs> um, part of the beauty of the Eastern traditions is the acceptance of, of, of truth, one truth irrespective of the, of the instrument, the teacher pointing to it. Okay. Um, for those joining us online, um, I'll record something or come and join you this afternoon sometime a little bit more. But this is the last morning of this series. The, in the book, again, Mind, Mind Management and Raja Yoga, people have been asking. So we posted the last couple of days the the link on our discussion I can do again today, um, which is a very, very good, very wonderful exploration. The key is we have to explore the mind. We have to explore self. We have to explore what we take to be ourself. Um, we have to engage in purification. What does that mean? We have to learn what is beneficial and what is not beneficial and engage in what is beneficial and not engage in what is not beneficial. And we call that purification which is a reorientation of the, of the mind, a reorientation of, of oneself, leading towards transformation of oneself and towards freedom, finally. Um, this is what we're engaged in. We're, um, and we go on the road here shortly. So um, Hari and Hara will remain here. Ashira is here with us this morning. She'll be in, she'll be in Yuma. Everyone's supporting the same, same cause. And meanwhile, Swami's going out. I'll leave tomorrow morning, like 7 a.m. local time, and drive towards first Albuquerque and then um, Lincoln, Nebraska, and then Song of the Morning uh, Yoga Retreat. And the uh, Yoga Retreat, Be Still and No um, Silent Retreat that we have scheduled, which is one week starting July 22nd, is now booked. And But there are retreats in Vermont and and uh, Illinois and Ohio, and there will be some more and lots of opportunities to get together. So we'll keep sharing the details. And then what happens after that? God knows what happens after that. You choose what happens. No, I mean, really, you choose what happens after that. Um, this life only has spiritual import. It doesn't have any independent meaning. So you choose. Do you want to be free? Do you want to be bound? We know the answer is freedom, but um, but we have to learn to be open-minded and 
and, and meaning adapted just to comedy, um, learn to learn to really, really, really observe and understand what leads towards peace and freedom and what, what leads towards bondage. And the study here relates to this. We've been talking about for the last week, from here, ego and mind and management of mind, management of the different, the different functions of the mind. Um, we'll pick it up. Yesterday we talked about manas management, the most gross aspect of the mind. And interesting, it's what we all relate to as mind, but really it's, it's just um, a machine. Uh, um, oriented towards the towards the sense objects and providing us with information, mm. both clear and not clear. <laughs> so Swamiji had said it's commonly called the mind, and and out of these seventy five thousand thoughts a day. How many of them are intentional? How many of them are really related to, to working things out where we engage with the, with the intellect? Most of them are reactive, right? So, manas. Tsankalpa vikalpa is the term. Okay, from here we come to a discussion on vrittis, or the whirlpools of the mind. Here's what Swamiji shares. It says, another aspect of the mind that must be clearly understood is vritti. <clears throat> Every mental behavior is perceived by the individual in the form of a vritti, a condition or a modification. <clears throat> vritti comes from the word vritta, which means a circle. Therefore, vritti means a circle or vortex, in which one becomes involved and cannot be freed from. One cannot extract oneself from that influence. The human mind is very weak. People are easily influenced by anything and everything. Positive experiences create a vritti in the mind and negative experience also, experiences also create a vritti in the mind. Worry is a vritti of the mind. Tension and stress are vrittis. How you perceive life is a vritti. Pessimism and optimism are vrittis. Negativity and positivity are vrittis. Vritti means a condition, and there are millions of conditions which are not even recognized because the understanding is not deep or evolved enough. A vritti arises when any of the four functions of the mind whether it's manas, buddhi, ahamkara, or chitta, becomes prominent. An altered mental state or outlook is experienced at this time, whether positive or negative. You recognize what he, what's intended here? He says an altered mental state. So... Mm -hmm. Yes, the delusion of looking at things the way we always do. Altered. It's considered now an altered state as opposed to the natural common. As opposed to the natural state. And the natural state would be said to be undisturbed or, or um, at rest, peace, like that. Mm. Pure. An altered mental state or outlook is experienced at this time, whether positive or negative. Just as a drop of ink can color a jar of water, a drop of ahamkara, chitta, buddhi, or manas colors the clarity of the mind. This change in the natural state of mind is called a vritti. So now he goes to Raja Yoga Sutra, page sage Patanjali, says that the mind is experienced through vrittis. 
So mind is here, or mind principle is here, but you only know about mind through the vrittis. And vrittis are painful as well as pleasurable. He's identified the five vrittis, which we study in, in Raja Yoga, which, are, which he considered important to achieve the state of dhyana and bring the mind under control. The yoga of Patanjali stops at the level of dhyana. It does not go beyond. Samadhi is an experience. But the effort, the practice, the instruction is up to dhyana and not beyond. For Patanjali, management of the mind was of prime importance as it would lead to the stage of dhyana. For this reason, he identified the vrittis, which are obstructions, in acquiring the state of dhyana, the meditative state, and did not identify all vrittis. The five vrittis mentioned by Patanjali are pramana, which is proof or right knowledge, Viparyaya, illusory or wrong knowledge, vikalpa, doubt, nidra, sleep, and smriti, memory. Pramana is connected with buddhi. When buddhi experiences something, it concludes that the subject is not a mere belief, but a proven fact. That which can be experienced is proven. How can you prove the taste of sugar? Hmm. How can you prove the heat of fire? Your experience is proof. So how can you prove the meditative state? The experience. Hmm. That which is perceivable, visible, factual, and can be the basis of an experience is pramana. It is the basis of knowledge and does not change. Viparyaya or branti jnana is illusory knowledge. It is what you surmise or estimate and take to be true, considered to be true. It's not proof, it is conjecture. So effectively all knowledge in the world is this, mm -hmm. is illusory, which is why we argue about it, because from one perspective or another, it will be different. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can go with one of the subjects of the day, COVID, and we can say, someone will say, I know for certain that the COVID vaccine is beneficial and here's the proof of it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So which, which type of vritti is that? Is that the first or the second? It would be the first. Second. Second. How would you say that everything is the second? Listen, if someone, if someone has proof that the vaccine works, someone else will have proof that the vaccine Doesn't work. does not work. So is it, is it, okay. uh, so it's illusory knowledge. It's the, it's what we argue about here. Here we are in Kali Yuga, the time of the quarrels. It's what we argue about here. We argue about everything here. This is the, uh, so it's not real knowledge. It's not real knowledge. Uh, and, and in particular, you're needing to hear this and know it. It's not real knowledge. Uh, the stuff that we discuss, anything related to the world, it's not real knowledge. It can only be related to that which is real in all states, in all places in all times. Only knowledge of that can be real knowledge. So he's differentiating the two. Mm. Has to be experiential. Now you could say experiential because I experienced that the vaccine helped me, but someone else would say, I experienced that the vaccine hurt me. <laughs> yeah. And there's no one who has come to say that the experience of the absolute hurt me. <laughs> uh, there would be confusion about what is the experience, which is which is dealt with here as well. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> the 
the mind is turning to different realities. Mm. We are creating and tuning. Creating and yeah. tuning. Yeah. Oh. So it's not proof, it's conjecture. This is the, I made a point of taking the, the, um, the Tao uh, Chonse. Um, and I'll do this from memory. So I made a point of taking his book, Essential Writings. I took a couple of different translations in the travel pack, in the traveling library. And the reason, there's, there's one discussion in particular. All of it is great. All of it is very high teaching. But he has this discussion about, he says, you and I disagree. You say this and I say that. Who is right and who is wrong? And how to determine who is right and who is wrong? Do we get a third party and we both explain our story to them, our understanding, and allow them to decide, will that help us to solve who is right or who is wrong? Or do we get two additional parties? How, how, how can we do? And this is the short version of it because he goes on for a bit. Um, and then he says, if there's truly right and wrong, and this is this, this field of mental knowledge, mental knowledge, uh, which is completely conditioned and it is this illusory knowledge. You can't, you can't reach consensus on it. You try in the world to reach consensus on something. Even the, even the preponderance of, of teaching about one religion versus another religion, you try to, this one's right, and therefore that one's wrong. That's the same kind of knowledge, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not actually experiential. And people can say, this is the way I interpreted my experience. And that's also not, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so he says, finally, if truly there is right and wrong, then it will be so clear that no one could disagree. And so, um, on the experience, the taste of sugar, one knows what it is upon tasting it, not upon hearing about it. And then they can try to describe it, but that will be, um, that will be viparyaya, that will be illusory knowledge, mm -hmm. trying to describe it. Right. So even here, the, in the teachings, we're dealing with illusory knowledge. Yeah. But pointing to that, which, which allows one to experience and become firm. And become from. Uh, yes? Um, um. This brain wants to uh, cloud, vid, vid, vid cloud. It, it, it wants something to stand on. That's what it's seeking. And so it, so it will go to, well, this is right. Um. This is right. Um, but still, it, 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 now, it can say one thing. It can say, God exists, our mother exists. Yes, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's experiential, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, very good. So guided, uh, guided to hold on to that. Well, that's the, it, 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 that's experiential. So that's truly experiential. But then when you start to talk about it, mm -hmm. oh, okay, fine, you know. Um, it is what you surmise or estimate, because now you're trying to describe the experience and express the experience to someone else. And again, the sugar example is a really good example in terms of understanding these different vrittis. Um, okay. Sometimes we hear this example of having a blind, blind man describing the elephant. Yes, yes, it's so beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. Five, Five men, men. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Beautiful, awesome. Oh, so it's guy. A different experience for each of for them. For each of them. They don't, they don't agree on the, on oh. the elephant itself. Oh. Oh. Question, is the first one also considered a birthday? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. So enlightenment again is equated with firm intellect. Oh. Okay. And intellect can only be become firm when it locates that which is unchanging. Hmm? Yeah. So, and it has to learn that through experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we go through a process of questioning and listening outside, inside, all of this. And the, this scientific life, this life is a science experiment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we go through the science experiment. We're learning what works, what doesn't work. And, and then finally, we have to learn what is consistent here. What, what can I put my... Because... The brain, as you said, is looking for something that it can hold on to, but there's no thing that it can hold on to. Uh, um, but it can, the intellect can realize that which is unchanging. It's not a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in trying to talk about it, arguments will come. Oh. But, in, but in the direct understanding of the experience and, and the import of it or the purport of it, that's okay. Of course, and so that's said also to be a vritti, and that is this right knowledge. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, and you see, it is a thought. If if you look, you see it is a thought. You see it is. You see it is. Um, it's a saving thought, as it were, because some other thought will arise, but within the mind itself, there's a, there's a firmness. Um, in the intellect, and that firmness begins to penetrate the rest of the the rest of the mind as well, and so it doesn't wander as much, and right, oh. and it doesn't go to the old habits as much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one one could imagine that Swami Shivananda, the mind is firm, firm on solid ground, but not a thing. Oh. Oh. Okay. So, and yeah, vritti, but saving grace. <laughs> because that vritti then, um, well, here, I know it's discussed here as well. Okay, so illusory knowledge, which we take to be knowledge. And that's the point of this discussion is we take this to be knowledge, but really all of what we take to be knowledge is illusory knowledge or, um, and he says, if you see smoke in the distance, a thought will arise. There is a fire somewhere. However, it is not yet not certain as yet whether the cause of the smoke is fire. When a distant object which cannot be perceived directly is accepted by the consciousness, it is conjecture. If you need to know the arrival time of a train, you call railways inquiries and learn the train is two hours late. Now you keep estimating when the train will arrive and look for proof based upon your estimation. At the end of two hours, you make a phone call again and find the train has been further delayed. There is proof of delay, but your mind is engaged in estimation. And this is called illusory knowledge. So, and for example, all the talk, thought about religion, etc., is the same. It's estimation. It's estimation. Um, what we call spiritual knowledge is also estimation. Um, uh, as opposed to experiential. So you could say relatively better, relatively, or relatively leading towards freedom, relatively leading towards bondage like that. Mm. Vikalpa, doubt, we've been talking about Vikalpa, so here a little more, is a state in which many thoughts crowd the mind. So and we've all had this experience. Now, good news is there's a way to live, and this is what's being described here, and this is what's contained in the science of yoga. There is a way to live where vikalpa is minimized, um, and the thoughts thin, and the thoughts thin out, and, and all of the, the crowded thoughts, they begin to fall away, and clarity comes in the mind. He's, these states are real, and uh, and the way of life in order to get to these states is also um, existent. 
So they crowd the mind. You're not able to follow any one thought to its end. The presence of many thoughts deludes the mind and represents lack of clarity, discrimination, and wisdom. Doubt is a condition which overpowers the mind. People doubt each other and they also doubt God and Guru. Doubt is an integral part of everything. If I don't look at somebody, the person will think, Swamiji doesn't like me anymore. So, yeah. so that's that vikalpa, that's that doubt. Yeah. So, and what he says is absolutely correct. It's true for every one of us. That both ways, the feeling that arises or the thought that arises and in your own relationship with other, the same. So it's a part of the fabric. The doubt will come, which will disturb the mental harmony. If I talk and laugh with one person, someone else will think, why is he talking and laughing with that person? He's not even looking at me. The doubt will come, and that is a vritti. From doubt issues jealousy, hatred, and other negative qualities. Your garden of life is adorned with these negative qualities. Hate, jealousy, and greed are all flowering in your garden, and you take care of them so well, you protect them, and you desire that these flowers should grow. You identify with these qualities. You don't identify with wisdom. You identify with things that are restrictive in nature. You don't identify with those that are uplifting. Doubt always gives birth to negative vrittis and will always give birth to, and will always gives birth to positive vrittis. Will strengthens the positive while doubt strengthens the negative. And here he's called, calling sankalpa will, mm -hmm. which we could say to be resolve, mm. firm resolve. So that's also sankalpa, will, okay. Resolve and will go together. We've explored this. Oh. Will makes the mind clear, sharp, creative, dynamic, and vibrant, while doubt makes the mind clouded. Sage Patanjali has also explained nidra or sleep is a vritti, as it is an altered state of consciousness in which there is absence of awareness for a period of time. The absence of light at night indicates not the absence of the world, but the absence of perception. The world will continue to function, but you will not be able to perceive it. Similarly, nidra is absence of awareness from the mental dimension, while the presence of awareness in the mental dimension is the waking state, where you are up, active, and alert. The absence of that awareness indicates the sleeping state. Vrittis are active in the waking state, and in the absence of awareness, a vritti is also generated in the form of nidra, sleep, or disconnection. The fifth vritti identified by sage Patanjali is smriti or memory, which is an aspect of chitta. Smriti is an altered state of consciousness in which there is a lack of awareness. When you're lost in memory, you forget your surroundings, you lose touch with reality and the external world. So I give the, the waterfall example as part of that, but you have one, have lots of them. Yeah. Oh. Which is as soon as the, as soon as, okay, fine, an object is experienced, um, the way the mind works, that object takes on the reality within the mind, and then the file folders are consulted about prior experience with objects like this. So the name has to be pulled out and then the comparative function about which one is the better one, meaning Raga Dvesha, which one will which one will lead me towards happiness and which one will lead me towards unhappiness or suffering. And so the whole comparative function and the the rating system and all of that in in the chitta are consulted. So and it's what is considered to be um, how do we say? It, it seems to us that this is normal. 
-hmm. It seems to us that this is normal. In other words, we've accepted the condition. Mm -hmm. But it is a dis-ease, state of dis-ease, state of disease. An altered state? It's an altered state. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. A little more. Um, according to Sage Patanjali, the five rittis are what one needs to know, understand, and go beyond in order to attain the state of yoga. Mm -hmm. Vrittis are born due to the union of the mind with the senses. Mm -hmm. If the mind does not unite with the senses, vritti will not be, vrittis will not be born. The senses perceive an object and create a desire in the mind. The two unite at this point, and that is where the mind becomes trapped in its own whirlpools. Thus, union of desire and object, senses and mind, give rise to vrittis. The experience of vrittis is internal or mental, it's not outside. And, and we can say that the experience that we have with sense objects is exclusively an internal experience. It's never an external experience. That even means people, human beings, for everyone online joining us, it even means people, human beings, it's exclusively an internal experience, not an external experience. What you are experiencing, in fact, is the vrittis. You're not experiencing something other than the vrittis. And, and as are the vrittis, then the experience is labeled as pleasant or painful, good or bad. But purely an internal experience. Is that... Um, through the process that we've been studying of going through the four different types of... Yeah, and the vrittis are mental only. They're not external. They're, they're in the mind. Whether the object is in the mind or not is arguable. But whether what's being experienced is in the mind or not is not really. It can be argued, but it's, but it's hard, to, hard to draw any conclusion that a thought is anywhere but in the mind. <laughs> So, uh, as we were discussing earlier, I'm sure one could argue the point. They bring about a change in the normal state of the mind. The dominating vritti at any given point of time influences your thoughts and behavior. Sage Patanjali's teachings on Raja Yoga are aimed at checking these vrittis. He says that if there is a vritti, it will always influence your mind and make it dissipated and a dissipated mind cannot become one-pointed. It cannot perfect dhyana, experience samadhi, or attain a balanced state of life. Therefore, try to be free of these conditions which disturb your mind, which alter your natural state of mind and thinking. Know them, understand them, and change them. So even right knowledge um, is a vritti, as we had discussed. And even that um, well, it, 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 if properly employed, it can lead to being free of the vrittis, as it were. Well, like, you, like you have said, uh, even the desire for the Lord falls away. Um, it, 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 falls away it falls away as the feeling being separate falls away. Ah. Right. Uh, it, it must. If you, if you do not know yourself to be separate from that which you wish and there is no longing, then what is arising? Okay, and, uh, and yet still the vrittis can uh, keep popping up even after that. I subscribe to the clouds not being a concern. Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. Because they're not, I, me, or mine. So, vritti is very much a, a personal relationship. Vritti is very much a personal relationship. It's mental, meaning my mind. But when there is no my mind, <laughs> oh, um, so, how, how do you, what's this recipe of freedom? To eliminate the? Vrittis. To eliminate the desires. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eliminating the desires to see through, then what's happening with the vrittis? They fall away. 
Uh, oh, oh. And at some point, I, me, mine is gone. It's already gone in the meditative state. Okay. Oh. And then we don't talk about vrittis. Okay. So he says, if there is a vitti, it will always influence your mind, your mind, mm -hmm. and make it dissipated, and the dissipated mind cannot be one, become one-pointed. It cannot perfect dhyana, experience samadhi, or attain a balanced state of life. Therefore, try to be free of these conditions which disturb your mind, which alter your natural state of mind and thinking. Know them, understand them, and change them. Um, in particular, those last four that are studied, yes? Uh, so he's used a special word in this context, vritti nirodaha. He did not use the word virodaha, opposition. He does not say that you should oppose your mental states or struggle with them. People usually practice virodaha. When you sit down for your japa or meditation, you realize that your mind is running everywhere and you struggle with the mind so it can be inspired to come to a point of focus and practice dhyana. Here you are opposed, opposing the dissipated vritti of the mind, but yoga says not virodaha, not opposition, not even avarodaha, not suppression, but nirodaha, cessation. Nirodaha means to stop a process which is taking place. If there's a flow of water, you put your hand in it, on it, and it stops. A thought comes, you flash the red light at it. Another thought comes, you again flash the red light at it. Slowly, the number of thoughts reduces. Nirodaha means to provide the right direction for the natural process, not by opposing it, but by redirecting it. When you become anxious, thinking that your mind is not engaged in the practice and therefore you will not be benefit, benefited, you begin to struggle with yourself and practice virodaha. It is when you understand that yes, your mind is not engaged in the practice and slowly try to bring it under control that the dissipations of the mind will cease and you attain one pointedness. Finally, if one drop of black ink falls in a jar of water, never mind, just don't put 10 drops in. <laughs> Accept what has happened, don't oppose it, but don't allow it to be amplified. A Yogananda quote comes about the need to be forgiven for what we've done. And, and Swamiji says, you don't need to be forgiven. Just don't do it again. <laughs> so I hear the same, you put one drop in, fine, don't do it anymore. At the same time, try to clear up the cloudiness that has already taken place. You can do this by adding some clear water to the jar. This is what is achieved through the practice of Raja Yoga. Managing the vrittis is possible through Raja Yoga. And that was the message of the Yoga Sutras. Hari Om Tatsan. Um, Hari, would you mind checking to see if we have any questions? And he continues on with a, more of an explanation of Raja Yoga, but on the same subject. This is so lovely. Ah. Oh. Question or comment? Oh, no. Okay. So Mike is saying, I hope you have a safe and enjoyable trip. Thank you, Mike. Your schedule there today. Oh. Is oh. anyone going to continue this daily practice while you're away? Ah, so I'll answer that question. The practice, yeah, yes, but this will end the Facebook broadcast here for now. Um, however, my intention is to continue to come back on Facebook for satsang broadcasts as part of the retreats and such when that's possible. So I will notify here. But I can't tell a schedule for what days. I can say that through the grace of God alone, Facebook maintains every single satsang. So there are two years worth right here. 
and whatever additional ones we're able to to broadcast live while we're traveling, they will remain here as well. So we'll do our best to communicate and um, we're grateful for the Sangha, the support of the Sangha. We're grateful for the for the seekers who who wish for freedom, especially those who who hear and and choose to come within. Um, I, I I was reminded of a quote yesterday about happiness, and and uh, one of the saints said, "It's not wrong to seek happiness; it's just wrong to seek it outside." <laughs> and so, mm, oh, okay, we'll close. Final prayers in RT one seven four. Om Om Trayambakam Yatamehe Sugandim Pushti Vajanam Or Vai Rokameva Bandiran Mritor Mokshiyama Mritat Om Trayambakam Yatamehe Sugandim Pushti Vajanam Or Vai Rokameva Bandiran Mritor Mokshiyama Mritat Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Or Vai Rukameva Bandhanan Mritor Mokshiyama Mritat Om Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Purnam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Shantu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashanto Makashi Dukabhat Bhave Asatoma Sat Gamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mritor Maamritam Gamaya Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudashate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vasishate Om Shanti 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 Hi O adorable Lord of mercy and love, salutations and prostrations unto Thee. Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient. Thou art Satchitananda. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion, and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptation and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, anger, greed, hatred, and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms, let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. And for all the saints and sages of all the traditions, time will rise for our.